a case of just perseverance, really. You know, when I look back, when I was 19, 20, I wasn't good enough to have a go, but I loved it. Laugh, you know, I always say a little old, old age, you know, <laughs> played, played a bit of cricket and got to play professionally. And I still get to keep in touch with these just legends. And, and we don't talk about this much, but I spent three years not wanting to be around on this planet much. Unfortunately, people think that it's an easy way to make money. And that's where I call them sticker lickers, the import of bats in. Stick the labels on, sell them out, that's it. If anything goes wrong, you don't see them for dust. What is up everyone and welcome back to another interview with myself, Chris Dodge, and the Winner Mentality YouTube channel. And today we're joined uh, by someone who I've met before, a long time ago, three years ago now, Paul. Um, but we're joined by Paul Aldridge, a former cricketer and now bat maker. How are you, Paul? I'm very well. How are you? I I'm good. I'm good. We're both ma making the most out of this. Uh, unfortunately, cricket season uh, doesn't allow for that. Um, but yeah, we'll get more into that. Um, um, so we'll just start off really. Where did your love of cricket start? Because it's been a massive part of your life. So where did yeah. it begin for you? Not a huge part. Um, well, my dad played, you know, that was, was from a, a very young kid. I just used to go down to the club that I grew up at, a club called Swarkston Cricket Club in, in Derbyshire. Um, and watch my dad play, you know, and I'd mess around behind the nets with my mates. So I was always learnt many there. My sort of age is always older, so I was sort of always wanted to go in the nets with the older lads and do all that. Just loved it, and they made me feel welcome. And um, and then really it was from when I was about probably eight and nine, and I was starting to get the real hang of it. You started wanting to have a go with the adults, and there was the junior cricket wasn't around then that you get now. Um, so you used to go and have a bowl in the nets, and you used to have a bit of a go, and then you'd pray for someone not to turn up on a Saturday so you could go on field or play. Or, but but then that was it really. So that was how it all started, you know, just the the involvement really, and then just watching and being inspired by others, I suppose, you know. Yeah. And and you, you made obviously the grade. And so just talk to us about how you got noticed by, by Derbyshire, really, and, and how and how it came about that you went. Well, I didn't go through the system. So mm -hmm. I, I played for a club that wasn't sort of, a, as you'd say, a fashionable club. Uh, it didn't I didn't even consider that at the time. It was just I played for the club that I loved and that was it. But... So I didn't play any age group cricket apart from, funnily enough, I'd play one county age group game a year and it was always up at Glossop where no one else wanted to play. And I always did all right, but never got asked again until the following year. So that was the only age group stuff I ever played. And so when I sort of got to the age where I loved cricket, I just absolutely breathed it you know everything was cricket loved all sports but cricket was my thing i just thought i got something and i wanted to be a professional cricketer it's all i had on my mind um i was constantly told that i wouldn't be and but how do you get into it because i'd seen guys as i got a little bit older into my teens and early 20s i'd, I'd seen guys who were fantastic local cricketers who'd had a couple of goes and didn't get there so um but they it was almost looking back they put all their eggs in one basket and thought Derbyshire won't give me a go that's it so I sort of looked at it in a different way and I just wanted to play any cricket I could get hold of so I played local rep cricket you know gentlemen's matches got invited to play to all sorts of stuff and um so I didn't go through the, the system as people would normally depict going into professional cricket. So I think my first trial game was when I was about 19 for Derbyshire and it was just one game and that was it. But I knew there'd got to be another way. So, or I'd got to find another way, basically, because yeah. I wasn't being looked at by Derbyshire. Um, 
and to be fair they didn't really look at that many local lads at that time so I just wrote to all the counties that's what I that's the way I did it I just pen and paper out wrote to counties and not to get a trial just to see if they wanted a net bowler go and do winter nets and, and it was just a case of just perseverance really you know when I look back when I was 19 20 I wasn't good enough to have a go but I loved it I mean I absolutely love being around professional cricketers professional sportsmen still do and yeah. you know I idolize them here and now and I just uh, it was what I wanted and and so when the knockbacks came, you don't get a contract, you don't get a contract, you know, you have a bad game or... It didn't really, you're a bit disappointed, but I didn't expect too much at the end of the day. And I just, I went in with a view, because I love cricket that much and wanted to shine at my level, I thought this has got to make me better. And that's the way I sort of went about it. And... Um, it took some time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and would you say for young cricketers nowadays who maybe get turned away by, by counties, would you say it's maybe harder now to sort of get into it or would you say it's, it's, it's easier for them? I don't think it's changed. The only thing that's changed is that kids now have got more to hand than ever before. They've got, they can contact through the internet you you know you don't have to write letters anymore or you don't have to go and see people face to face and ask you can email you can you can get in touch in any way you desire the only other thing i'd say is because of the academy systems is a good thing in one way but i think it's detrimental in another because i think it gives youngsters a false impression of where they are but also, I think they feel, and maybe so, you know, the fact maybe that they're slightly tied to a county. But at the end of the day, for, I always look, looked at it and still look at it and say to kids, and I did when I was coaching, for every one of you wanting to have a go, there's another thousand. So if... If you put all your eggs in one basket and say, I'm only going to play for Derbyshire, I'm only going to play for Leicester, I'm only, whatever your county is or where you are, your chances of success are hugely diminished because you're, you might be good enough, but your player profile, so to speak, the profile that they do now, might not fit in with what that club needs at that time. Whereas if you get out there to all the counties and just say, look, this is what, I'd just love to come and do some net bowling, you know, do some fielding. Do, excuse the term, do the shit jobs yeah. that no one enjoys doing and show willing and it's a foot in the door. Absolutely. And obviously it, you were a late bloomer. Uh, 26 uh, was... Uh, is a bit late. Is later now for for professional cricketers. But talk to me about that feeling after having grinded your way really to to that and got your foot in the door, just so to speak. What was the feeling stepping out on your first class debut back in 1995? Well, it, firstly, to get a contract was just pure elation, and the and the joy of it was that. Um, it's funny how, how life sometimes throws, throws things at you. Is, um, because I've trialled for so many years, I, th I think I was, I was 20, 24 and Derbyshire phoned me up to see if I'd go and play in this twos game for them at Blackpool against Lancashire. Sorry, at Lytham in a three-dayer, then Blackpool in a one-dayer. And, um, and I said Bernie Mayer was the captain in coach of the twos at the time I says no Bernie you know I've got to concentrate on work now I'm 24 blah 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 you know I've, I've given it a go okay and then five minutes later the phone rang and it was my one of my best mates still you know keep in touch with him now he's a great lad 
and a lad called Johnny Owen. And it, we played club cricket together and we went out together, we did everything together. And he got in touch with me and said, Aldo, are you playing at Lytham and Blackpool? And I says, no, you know, I'll explain the reasons. And he says, no, oh, go on, play this one. I says, why? He says, well, they've asked me and I won't know anyone. Nice, I just thought, <laughs> just got <laughs> play my drip. And, and I said, all right, tell Bernie, I'll come and play, but just this one, and it gives you an intro in. So we went, and Lancashire turned up with one of the best second teams you'd ever see. They got test players in there, you know, but this was about a three day. And we got all trialists apart from three players, and one of them was the coach. So we rocked up against this gun length team and beat them. And Johnny got a load of runs, I got a load of wickets and some catches. Uh, we beat them in a three day and then the, we were going to Blackpool for the one day. And the coach says, you can go out tonight. They've got an even stronger team coming tomorrow. <laughs> but to beat them in the championship is brilliant. So true to our word, we went out, enjoyed ourselves. Next day, we just got to breakfast in the hotel. Tim O'Gorman was coming up from Derbyshire, just arrived. And um, so he wasn't picked in the championship game at Ilkeston, just up the road here, mm -hmm. the first team. So he just arrived and the phone rang and he had to travel straight back because Alan Warner had been hit in the back of the end with a ball during fielding practice. So he, he chokes us straight back. So we've got this even stronger Lanks team against them. We've got 10 men. And we beat him again. <laughs> Both had stormers. And we came back and just had a ball. Enjoyed it. Carried on the rest of that season. So it came to the end of the season. We come back from a twos game. We heard that we got a contract. Well, we dumped the car and we weren't seen for a week. We, I think we were out on the town for a week. Just <laughs> in absolute joy. And, um, and then to be set on the staff with your best mate, was just something else, you know. It was a, yeah. it was an incredible experience, um, and then to actually just, my memories are, you know, my actual first class debut was at uh, Oxford, that's the universities. But I don't class that as my first class debut because it, the yeah. universities are silly and different. Things. We had, we had, we had a, a chat with Daryl Mitchell, and he said exactly the same thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, it wasn't, it, you know, we played in that and I can remember playing it because Devin Malcolm played, Chris had, and we got a pretty, you know, decent team out. And, um, but it, it, it sort of wasn't that, that never really stuck him in mind, that game particularly. It was just the, the whole event of getting on the staff and then start, you start back for your winter training as you did then it, it sort of after Christmas and, and just going and being around these just great, great cricketers and people. And it was like a dream come true. So you just got your head down, just played second 11 and, and just did what you were told, basically. That's the way, that's the way I did it. And, and I think fortunately for me, being a little bit older, it stood me in good stead because I'd done the yards. So I'd almost got to play catch up with the younger lads. So I was 26, but was classed as a young lad on the staff. So I was having to try and learn twice as quick as everyone else. It was harder to learn as you're older than it is when you were 20, 21. But I think I spent the first two years as a professional 12th man, really. I just traveled around 12th man in, and I, I absolutely loved it because I did everything. I would run to the sweet shop, shop I'd run to the ice cream van, I'd fetch sandwiches. I'd do anything for him. And because of that, I, I looked at it like my, my friendship on the building site, you know, when I left school. So I, I just looked at it like that and did, did the dog jobs, you know. And the, the international lads looked after me like you wouldn't believe. They were absolutely brilliant. Just because they realised I was just I was there to do it properly and get 
it didn't bother me. Just get stuck in. I was there having a go and I would try my best, you know, and that was it. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's great here. And you mentioned uh, you play with some, some great players. So which ones in particular had the biggest impact on you and why? When I joined the staff, it was, I think you're a little bit overawed by it. So you, you've got, at the time, you've got sort of um, Kim Bond, who was captain, and overseas at that time was Daryl Cullen and the South African batter. Um, great player, unbelievable player, um, tricky bloke to get on with, but a great player. Uh, you've got Chris Adams, legend of a man, you've got Dominic Cork, Philip De Freitas. You know, you've got all these people. Um, so when you first go in, I think you you just look and watch and they they inspire you. And then the first real hit for me, I think, that made me look at things in a slightly different way, even though it actually was a bit crushing at times because it was hard. It was hard school. It was Dean Jones when he came over to captain. It was hard school. It was the real Aussie way. It, it was sort of a, it was a tough period in some ways because just unfortunately, as I joined the staff, my dad was diagnosed with a rapid form of dementia. So my dad was basically, as I joined the staff, got this and was dying while I was trying to forge a career. So in some ways, cricket was an escape. But by the time Dino, Dean Jones got there, it was at a serious point, you know, I was starting to push on my career a little bit, bit. my dad was really bad and I was, I was still living at home at that point. Um, so I'd go home, see all this horrible stuff at home and then come and play cricket. So, um, Dean, Dino sort of, had a, I had a chat with him and he sort of understood a little bit of that and, it looked after me a little bit, but it was still hard. You know, it didn't, it didn't pull any punches. You know, if 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 you thought you were doing something wrong, he would tell you. There was no, there was no cutting corners. But actually, what what I did realise was he he had empathy, even though it was tough. You know, and uh, he never he never asked anyone to do anything that he wouldn't or hadn't done himself. So. That has stayed with me because it was something that my dad always taught me. But to have that actually at that time, quite empowering, really, because it made me stick to my guns a lot, a lot, you know, with almost stubbornly at times. Um, so, yeah, I think Dean Jones, Chris Adams was a, was a big influence while I was there at Derby. Even, even when he left and I didn't really see him that much, you know, when I got captain in 99, he was the first person to get congratulations to me before my own teammates. He got, you know, congratulations over the phone. So, yeah, I think Dino, Chris Adams was sort of there in the background. Dino was a big influence at that time and has been since. He's been a great support to what I've done since. And uh, we stay in touch regularly, you know, and uh, which is for, I always laugh you know I always say little old Aldo you know <laughs> played, played a bit of cricket and got to play professionally and I still get to keep in touch with these just legends in in life and then and then later on was Michael Slater when he came over and just his attitude he didn't, he didn't have that great a year but his attitude and I, I got to spend a lot of time with the Australian cricket team with him and um, both in Australia and here and just that mentality was, it, it, it just did something for me. It was positive, you know, and yeah. it, even when it's been tough times, it, you've got to try and be positive. And that's sort of what rubbed off on me, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So you retired in 2002. Did you have envisions, did you have visions of firstly coaching and secondly bat making before you actually retired? No, I... Life just twisted around. It was, um, I'd got a little business going with, with someone um, and that went not the way I wanted it. Let's say at that time, it made me make the decision that I would never go into business with anyone again. 
it goes. <laughs> so, so in this, in the, in one year, I got done in business and lost my dream job. Um, it was a tough pill to take. That was, and I spent, in all honesty, I spent three years. I, we don't talk about this much, but I spent three years not wanting to be around on this planet much i'll okay. tell you it was a tough tough period um and it was only sharon god bless her you know dragged me through it and and actually the lord's taverners to be honest i got involved with them by chance and it made me realize that other people had been in the same boat or were in the same boat or was you know just struggling with things and that helped me i, I always say you know i, I call the older you know the older cricket bat people who buy bats on the group page of Facebook I always call it the old cricket bat family but the Lord's Taverners I call it part of my family because they helped me through some difficult times so at that point when everything went belly up for a period and you know lost money um, I just didn't have a target anymore a, you know a, a sort of a regimental sort of lifestyle anymore it's sat twiddling my thumbs so i thought well what shall i do and i had some success doing some coaching i was playing but just coaching voluntary and we've got a couple of lads you know that eventually had a go at counter cricket and i thought well okay let's have a go at this you know it'll tide me over for a period and and again, a little bit of luck. At that time, there was no, um, there were no ex-professionals really doing what I was doing in the local leagues. Now it's flooded. You know, there's ex-pros everywhere doing it. At that time, there weren't. So I put a few emails out, and I was always booked a year ahead, which was brilliant. And we built clubs up, and it, it sort of changed over there from just coaching to going in and building clubs up that had struggled and. And I really enjoyed it, but I knew it had a lifespan, you know, and uh, and I just thought there's got to be something else here because as I get older and I'm coaching kids, my communication skills with kids who are 12, 13, 14, are very distant when you're in your 40s, you know, and sort of pushing 50. You're going to be, you're not talking the same language anymore. So... I sort of, I just took that point to go, right, let's find something else. And that, that's sort of just the way I looked at it at that time, really. It was circumstance and, and just a bit of foresight, I guess, yeah. would, be the, would be the term. A bit of foresight, a bit of honesty in what, in what you're doing. Absolutely. So you mentioned actually early that you, you went into a building apprenticeship after, uh, after your school time. Do you think yeah. that had a had a bit of a, an influence on why you went into cricket? But obviously, you're working, you got your hand your hands on. Do you think that um, may, maybe had a little bit of an impact on it? It may it may well have done. Um, I enjoy creating things. Um, I do enjoy, you know, seeing something from start to finish, um, and I like to have. I like to do it my way, if that makes sense. Um, so the company that I worked for, or one of the companies that I worked I lost many jobs because I used to just, if I asked time for time off for cricket, they'd say no, and I'd just go anyway, and that was me done, so I'd have to find another yeah. job. But, um, but one of the companies who were brilliant with me, they used to do a lot of work for the National Trust. So... I used to go out for specialist jobs and send me out with the old man, I'd bring him out to retirement, and there'd be me and him in this old army truck that he used to drive. And he was the old fashioned guy with a flat cap, bib and braces, shirt and tie, and jacket, and you go out and just labour for him. And I suppose those sort of days sort of stuck in my mind. And you still had guys creating beautiful things in a shed in the back garden. You don't see it now it's a unit on an industrial park so i suppose when i started this you know in my garage you know while i was coaching teaching myself the the mysteries of bat making um it was more of a 
perhaps a lifestyle thing. I thought I'd quite enjoy working from home. If I can earn 500 quid a week working from home, I'll be happy sort of thing after what we'd been through. And, um, and that was the whole premise of it. There was, there was no ideas of grandeur or anything. It was just, this will do me. And, and then little did I realize what a monster it could create, <laughs> really. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, that, that's, it may well have had an influence. I don't see it, but many of my playing ex-playing mates said, we knew you'd do something like that, you know. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's, it, I, I didn't see it myself. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And sort of, what, how much did you have to learn on the job when it came to bat making? Because when, obviously this, it's quite an intricate thing to try and start, make yourself stand out because at the end of the day, it's a bit of wood. Um, but how, how did you, how much, firstly, how much did you have to learn and how much do you have to make yourself stand out? Um, I had to learn everything. So I was I was fortunate in the fact that um, when I was playing, they were still making bats in this country. So me being me, when the internationals went to fetch the kit, and and because I was a little bit older, just stood me in good stead. I was sort of socially on a little bit of a par. We enjoyed a beer together. We sort of our sense of humour is with the same age group, you know. And so I'd say, hold oh, no, on, you fancy coming to Slazinger or to, you know. And I'd go, yeah, great. What, what time do you want me there? You know, and I'd get, jump in the car with them, off we go. And so to subconsciously, some of the things that I saw in the factories stuck in my head when I came to do it myself. So I could sort of remember bits what I'd got to do from there was do the research to try and work out how you got to that stage. So I, I initially approached companies over here who weren't really interested in helping me. So I got in touch with James Labour of Labour and Wood over in New Zealand through someone that I know. And he sent me some willow over, clefts already pressed and handled, so I've got the kit. So I quickly set about making those into firewood and uh, because I was trying to learn to shape and it was just basically a pile of rubble by the time I'd done. And then you get better, you get better. And then I just went, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it the right way. I'm not going to be a shaper. I want to be honest. I want to be honest about what, what this is. It's my, I want to put my name to it. I want to be straight and up front. It's the way I played my cricket. It was just, you know, lay it on your sleeve sort of thing. And if you make a mistake, you take it. If you do well, you take it. You know, you, you take both both glory and failure, you know, together. That was the whole idea. And we just went with it. So I literally spent hours on YouTube looking at different snippets from different companies doing stuff right can do that can do that find a way to do it so i spent lots of money wasted money trying to get to certain stages until we got to a point where i went right okay let's we've got something here so the next stage then was getting willow but it's catch 22, you get willow, you need a back press, find a back press. Well, they're like hen's teeth. So it was like someone who I used to play cricket with or, or against um, through the taverners. Mike Gatton actually put me in contact with someone um, and they pointed me in the right direction to get a press. So we got press sent over from India and, and it just started like that. And it was, then I got to learn to press. I've got to do, it, it was, it was a real journey and there were some lonely times because things go wrong, you know, you sell a bat and it breaks. Why is it broke? You've got to find out. It shouldn't break like that. So you, you make those mistakes, you find out. And then over the years, I just went, right, we've got something. We've got, it took me three years to get pressing right and then it evolved. 
So from then, I don't think, I, I never look at it like I did anything to market myself, to be honest. I just did it. I just did. I'm an ex-professional cricketer. People walk in the garage to see who I'm working in the garage still while this is being finished behind me. Is it is what you see. You know, there's no hiding. I'm not saying that I'm not saying that I'm making them, we're not. We are making them. I'm I'm doing everything myself, apart from make the handles because it's too time consuming, you can't get the cane nail so easily. But everything is made by me on site for the customer. When when you first started making them, how did you did you have to learn sort of how to differentiate the different bats that you sell, you know, different willow types, that kind of stuff. Did that sort of come naturally as, as, as a progression in your business? Did you first start only making one bat? How did, how did it all like sort of unravel? Yeah, well, you know, you go into it and you sort of, you know, nothing about the grading system from the suppliers. You don't, you know, you don't know any of that. And so you've got to learn, you study. It's not anything. You, you, you study. If you want to do something, you get your head down and do it. As far as I, you know, it's, it's the only way I know. So I'm not, I'm not a person who has ever gone to university. You know, I was just someone who, if I want to do something, I'll, I'll get my head down and do it. So as far as the bats were concerned, it was right. I know what product we need because when I was playing, the bats that majority of the pros were using were nothing like club players were using so i knew the product and the performance that we wanted it was how i got that so it was learning the stages then it was learning what the, the willow grades are what are the best grades of willow so when i first had my willow from rights i had your grade ones grade twos grade threes well i soon realized I didn't like grade threes. So that's when, as you'll have seen, I'm one of the biggest sellers of butterfly willow around. That, that I changed from grade three to have butterfly. And it's as good as anything you'll get. But at that point, no one wanted to use it. The Asian companies bleached them as a, as a rule. They didn't like them. So that was something different that I was doing. But it was totally a case of learning every part from start to finish for me. Yes, we had to, I had to study and, and read and get on the internet and find all that and ask questions. Got in touch with a couple of retired bat makers. They really didn't give me any advice other than you'll find your way. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. And... And I just thought, well, I'll well, help you are. But actually, when I look back, their advice was the best advice I ever had in bat making. So, you know, you've just got to trust yourself. But unfortunately, people think that it's an easy way to make money. And that's where I call them sticker lickers. They import the bats in, stick the labels on, sell them out, that's it. If anything goes wrong, you don't see them for dust. You can't, there's no quick money making in this for me. If you're going to do it, let's do it and be, be what, be what Duncan Fernley used to be all those years ago in the 80s when they were, you know, the best bats around. And there were so many great bat companies around. And I loved that when I was growing up trying to get into cricket. But you don't see them now. They're just, they're a, most of them are big brands now, you know, they're out of reach of the general public, really, for what the pros get, because what the pros get ain't what they're generally selling in shops, because there isn't that much willow. Exactly, exactly. Um, last couple. Um, so what's the, a bit of a fun question, so what is the craziest uh, bat breakage that you have ever uh, experienced that people have come with you to to come and fix it for you? <laughs> so, um, well, you, you get your usual sort of snaps and things like that. I think the worst one was, 
as many people do, is, is an Asian gentleman ordered two top end bats off me. Exactly the same. And he asked about knocking in and all that. So about three months later, I had a message and um, saying my bat's delaminated. And I thought, that's strange. I mean, when you consider that we're having pros with these bats, I mean, there's, there's, there's one of the pros down at Sussex still using the, the bats that I made him. And the range hitting is like three years old, two, three years old now. The range hitting with the things, we're hitting 200 balls at a time. And all that they come back with is a few little cracks and that's it. So he's got this delaminated. I thought, that's very strange that. I thought, well, what's happened here? He sent it back. <laughs> and it was obvious what had happened. And he'd obviously, he said, I've knocked it in properly. He'd obviously spent about two months just beating the hell out in the middle of the bat with a mallet. Mm. Nothing else, but everything else was pristine. The edges weren't knocked in. The t- it just obviously walked around and yeah. just used a heavy mallet and just decimated the middle of the bat. And there was a circle like that. So I replaced it out of goodwill. Shouldn't have done really, but I replaced it out of goodwill. And lo and behold, about a month later, done the same to the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, I, I didn't replace that one, but you just like, just, at what, at what point do you think you're doing it any good, you know? Exactly. Brand new beauties as well, they were. But yeah, I mean, bat breakages are, you see a lot of just snaps. You used to see it when, um, uh, Australian cricket, David Warner used to have these huge bats. And I always remember going down to Derby because we did some bits and bobs for, on a term. I went down and my old playmate Michael Di Benito was batting coach at the time. And he was showing me these bats. He says, We well, love them as coaches because they just snap after three knocks and we use them as fielding bats. And they just they just shear across and they just dry. They just dry them out to get the weight out of them. And also using a lot of storm damage stuff because at the end of the day pros don't care. You know, if they're getting at that time, with those bats, they'd be given the international, they'd probably have 30, 40 bats just chucked at them. So, if one breaks and they're all good sticks, then fair enough, you know, we'll just change. But those are, you see stuff like that, that's just dry willow generally. If you'll get the odd storm damage, but you don't, I don't get many. I've had one actually, first time, and it's just come back. Um, and it must have been a false cliff and it's gone straight down the middle, just all the way, which is very, in fact, I don't think I've had one of them for seven or eight years. But I always say for me, if I get, if I get three a year that have snapped, I'm upset. But really, in the grand scheme of things, you know, the numbers that you do, it's not a bad, to be honest, I barely ever get one. But if I got three, I'd be thinking, we must have had some storm damage in there, you know, without seeing it. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of breakages are breakages at the end of the day. It's a, it's a piece of wood. You'll see, you tend to see more of the effects on TV with the the bats that just snap or handle. You see a lot of handles go these days because they're so thin and flexible, a lot of the handles that they use. Um, just get weight out of the bat. And a lot of players have got used to the thin handles. But um, which is totally against what I, I do. I hate, it. but it's uh, you tend to see that sort of stuff nowadays more than you did probably 20 years ago, 25 years ago. They put in bat restrictions. Um, well, there are talk of it. Do you think that it's healthy for the game to say put restrictions on, say, the thickness of the bat? The, the weight eg stuff like that i know it won't affect probably won't affect you business wise but in terms of a professional what what do you what's your thoughts on that um i think it was from a from an industry point of view i think the industry shot itself in the foot a little bit when it came out with these huge bats because they see the pros with something and everyone wants it well 
it's virtually impossible. I mean, the, the David Warner bats, they couldn't get them out to the public in 2 8, 2 9. They, they start, I think they started something like 2 14. Well, everyone wanted it, and it was an impossibility. What my uh, big bats, I, d I don't think the big bats make or made any difference to how far they were hitting it. The fact is that people used to hit it just as far when I was playing, but they didn't practice it. So when they reduce the, put the bat laws in, reduce the bat sizes, all it did was play into the batter's hands really because they're still getting big bats, but it's all condensed. So you look now and the fashion is full profile bats. No concaving in it or anything like that. So you've got this massive wood. If you add to that the flat wickets that they're playing on now, and they just stand and hit through the ball, I, I, I don't think that's particularly good for the game. It's the flat wickets. If it was me, from a personal point of view, bowler, but I do think that we need to see the ball do a bit more again. I think I don't think players, batters, should be able to stand there with confidence, knowing that if, plus the ridiculously short boundaries now, they've got safety bar safety yards and all that. If you combine that with flat tracks and how they, they've learned to just tee off and power hit, they can virtually go, if I miss it, miss it's carrying. Whereas if they've got to carry a guy on the boundary who's six foot four, and the boundary is 75 yards, it's got to go another 30 yards to clear him. So I think, personally, I think the wickets need to do a bit more, and the batters need to get the heads down like they used to have to, and learn what to, what to play and what to leave. I don't think there should be that confidence just to go at five, six and over you know, in, in championship and test cricket and think that's acceptable. I think the, it's not a 50-50 game then, you know, for me. So mm. I don't, there's a lot of talk about bats. The, the, I don't think the cricket balls do as much as they used to, certainly in this country. I think the, the cricket balls are quite what they used to be. So, um, and then you add, you add the white ball game and you've gone from using one white ball to a white ball from each end. So the, you don't see the wacky units anymore where all of a sudden it's reverse swinging and, you know, you don't see that. So um, I do think the emphasis has been a bit around the bats. You look at, you look at the wickets they're playing on, look at the boundaries that they're hitting to and the style of the batters now, then... I'd say it's more to do with that than the actual bats, the bat size itself. Because they're using lighter bats than ever, really. Mm. Not quite using two fives that they used to use 100 years ago. But, they, you know, when I was playing, two eight, two nine was a light bat. Now people want, you know, players are going two seven, two seven, two eight maximum. And they're supposed to be fitter and stronger. So it's all about that speed for them. Absolutely. Um... And finally, obviously, we can see the, the workshop being built uh, in the background. Yeah, um, there so, she is. So, uh, <laughs> so, including that, of course, what does the future hold for you? Is it something that you want to be doing for the rest of your working life? Um, and Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, as I said before, I'm, I'm a bit cussed with things at times, and I'm very, I'm very pro-Britain. Very pro-Britain in a positive way um, and I honestly believe that we over the years we've lost not not just in cricket but we've lost our trades we've lost we've lost identity not just the fact that you know we import all the time it's not that I I, I come from a I'm 51 now, and I just caught a glimpse of a time when workers work the old way. Still, they, you know, 
joiners were in the back garden and they're making beautiful oak door doors and windows in an eight before shed. You know, the craftsmen, absolute master craftsmen, working in the shed, producing stuff that you would never believe could be done. And then it went from these artisan businesses to almost faceless companies where the joiners were on an industrial unit somewhere. It was an industrial unit, industrial building, no personality. You just went in, machines in there, that was it. And I've got to be honest, I hated it. From the first time that I saw it, when I was still working in the building trade, the first time an old joiner is that the company that I worked for used for years moved to an industrial unit. It was awful. The old place was a ramshackle old shed that, you know, big sort of workshop had been added to over the years. And it was brilliant. And I suppose costs made them do it, but it lost something. So when I sort of did this, I, I mean, I'm always watching stuff on telly, you know, these, I don't know, barn builders and stuff like that. I love stuff like that, but I love the creation of things, but I love the personal story behind it. So that's why I, I've, I looked around it. We needed to move. You know, I've been working in my garage and it's just impossible now. It's just got, and I just looked around at places and it just didn't fit me. It wasn't me and what I was doing. So that's why we decided on this space, like down below there is wasted space. And we, we, we built this, we built this in the nine weeks that we've been locked down. <laughs> so um, just Sharon and I. So that's what we've done. But the view is my long-term goal, and it might never happen, but it's my goal, is I would love to eventually if I have to move from here, if everything went well, we'll eventually have to move from here. But for the time being, this is where it starts again. But what I would love in a, in a few years' time, my target is 10 years, is to have a place where we've got the brand big enough that we're still making by hand but we're employing bat makers on a bench, making bats. Like you see, if you, if you look on the old Gun and Moor pictures of the old Gun and Moor factory, and they got probably got 30 guys on the bench working the process of making bats. A very miniature version of that. And teaching people a trade. And that that is my vision. It's not about how many hundreds of thousands we can turn over or millions we can make. So we'll never do that. It's about us and people. And that is my thing. If, if we can, I always say we because it's me and Sharon, but I've got a mate of mine, Neil, who's been helping me out at weekends when I've just got too busy. And the idea is, hopefully he comes and works full time. But the idea is that we want, we want to encourage local people to get into trade. And, you know, not everything's about sitting behind a computer or, you know, having to have a university degree to, to make a life. It's not about that. It's about people have incredible skills. And it's what I would like to do is to be able to bring that back in where people are creating things by hand again and doing it the old fashioned way and just stand out because of it, because no one else wants to do it. And, Absolutely. you know, well, they perhaps want to do it, but financially won't, you know, so that's the, that's the long term aim. And even down to, we're, we're talking with some friends now of why can't the soft be made in this country. Why is it that they've never been made over here? And we're looking, it might never happen, but we're looking at that because I truly believe that it should be. And that's that's my targets. And, you know, we have plenty of people trying to poo-poo it, but I actually enjoy those things. I go, right, come on, let's let's go with it and see, see where it takes us and uh, we'll have a bit of fun doing it.
Absolutely. And I think it's a, gr- a great, great ethos to have as a, as a business. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for, for joining me, Paul. It's been an absolute, pleasure. Ab- absolute pleasure listening, listening to your story. Um, where can people buy your bats? Well, if you, we tend to do everything to order, but if you look at um, my website, uh, oldercricketbats.com, um, you can see everything on there. If you want to see literally everything on, that we do, look for my group Facebook page, Older Cricket Bats, because everything that we do, while we've been in lockdown, we've done every process, I don't know whether you've seen it, but we've done every process of this building here, from down below, below ground level, up, um, Sharon and I building that, and literally everything is on there that we do for everyone and there's nothing different you know whether it's a whether it's a 10 year old to an international player we don't do anything different so it's all there and and if you want to phone up have a chat you're not sure what you want or you want some advice even if it's not to buy from me but if you want some advice of the pitfalls what to look for and what not to buy just get in touch so I'm more than happy to help because I hate seeing people wasting money absolutely and I think the NHS clappers are out so uh... there we go I've just started now <laughs> yeah, f- fantastic stuff anyway uh, thank you very much for watching guys I do right. hope you did enjoy it and we'll see okay. you you take care